Uh, I am a, um, um, I'm an historian, I'm a medievalist, I teach at Vanderbilt University in arts and science. I also teach a little bit in the law school, but I'm one of the people here who is not trained as a lawyer. So that means that I'm going to take a little bit of a sociological perspective in my paper where I talk about religion in the public square. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of my own background that isn't on the page at all, which has influenced what I've decided to talk about today. Uh, one thing is that uh, I serve the United States Navy Reserve as a chaplain, and so a lot of the issues that Michael was talking about before, prayer in a public space, right, is something that I experience. Towards the end of the month, I'll go to Bahrain and spend Rosh Hashanah on an aircraft carrier. And uh, one thing that happens every night at the aircraft carrier at exactly 9.55 p.m. is the, uh, the, over the evening prayer. And so all the sailors on the ship are subject to this prayer recited over the microphone, right? You, you might argue they could cover their ears, they know exactly when it is, or they could try to go to sleep before the evening prayer happens. But it's one of those situations in which the chaplain gets up, or if there's no chaplain, obviously other sailors or officers might get up to give this evening prayer. And uh, it happens to everybody on every night on every ship in the Navy. Now this does, as Michael pointed out, have a long tradition in the Navy. And so the kind of long-standing uh, role there really might affect how we think about this tradition. So that's one thing that I, uh, that I do in addition to teaching at Vanderbilt. Another thing that I do is I'm trained by the conservative movement as a Messa der Gittin. I write uh, Jewish divorce decrees and that's another thing that I'm going to talk about today. So uh, you, as you'll hear in a moment I'll talk about beards in the military and uh, the, uh, the role of the Gittin, uh, of um, uh, Jewish divorce decrees in the public, uh, public sphere. So in speaking about religion in the public sphere, I'd like to talk, or I'd like to introduce the question of when the religious practices of individuals make it difficult for the state to achieve its aims in the context of a legal system that increasingly sees the private needs of individuals as trumping those aims. Specifically, I'll talk about two issues. As I said, number one, beards in the military, which are an interesting case because they pit the goals of the military, right, the mission against the ritual needs of Jews and Sikhs and others, and of religious divorce, which can stand in the way of civil divorce, as individuals who have been civilly divorced may nonetheless think that they can't get remarried because they don't have the imprimatur of their church. Right, in which case the legal system, the civil legal system, is essentially beholden to the religious establishment. Since the right to marriage, clearly established in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, could conceivably be constrained where a system of religious divorce operates essentially in parallel to a system of civil divorce. And where individuals might consider themselves unable to take advantage of uh, remarriage, civil remarriage, because of the difficulties experienced in obtaining a religious divorce. So these two areas are interesting complements to one another because in one we see individuals' religious observance pressing on the needs of the state itself, and in the other we see individuals' religious observance pressing on their ability to exercise a right which the state ostensibly wishes to facilitate. So they may also be seen in the context of the two prongs of the First Amendment related to religious freedom that Michael pointed out to us. Since the idea of one's religious practice being manifest in personal grooming lends itself to, to issues of free exercise, while as we shall see the entanglement of the state in uh, the religious affairs of individuals in order to preserve the state's interest in the right to marriage or remarriage lends itself to consideration of the Establishment Clause. So we'll have a little bit of each. Let me begin by giving a bit of background on the issue of beards in the United States military. It's unsurprising, perhaps, that the 1970s saw not only a messy turn in terms of hairstyles, but also the introduction of some loose strands of argument about personal grooming in general. In a 1974 article in the Albany Law Review, Neil J. Dilhoff, at the time himself a naval JAG officer, wrote about recent litigation to establish a constitutional right to avoid restrictions on hair length, facial hair, and other grooming styles. Think about what's going on in the public sphere in general in the 1970s. Think about what hair looked like. Right, by Dilhoff's reckoning, questions of a right to one's personal appearance extend all the way back to an 1891 Supreme Court ruling 
in uh, Union Pacific Railway Company versus Botsford, a case which on its face had absolutely nothing to do with grooming, but in which Justice Horace Gray famously declared that no right is held more sacred or is more carefully guarded by the common law than the right of every individual to possession and control of his own person. It's a fundamental right to you know, control your own person. Yet, as Dilhoff points out, Case law surrounding the military and the prison system, by the way, maybe we can see some points of commonality between the military and the prison system, right, has been treated much more consistently by the courts than that involving the private sector or even public servants such as school teachers, policemen, and firemen. While much of the relevant litigation deals with soldiers' rights to grow their hair long, in which case it oddly seems that soldiers in the 1970s seem to have sidestepped the problem with a circuit court suggestion that they wear short hair wigs to disguise their luxuriant or lengthy coifs. Just imagine this. Although this solution was found not to have been uni universally acceptable when it was actually tested in the courts. The issue of beards reared its head at about the same time. A communication from the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, in 1970, opened the door to beards. But this permission was trimmed back in the early 1980s and completely cut off by Zumwalt's uh, successor, Admiral James Watkins, in 1984. That same year, General John A. Wickham, Chief of Staff of the Army, eliminated an exception to grooming regulations allowing Sikh soldiers to retain their beards as well as others who bore conspicuous items of faith. Zumwalt's reasoning, opening the door to beards, right, seems to have been a version of that suggested by Union Pacific Railway Company versus Botsford. That is, affirming autonomy in grooming was tantamount to affirming the dignity of the individual. Likewise, a 1995 case in the Israel Supreme Court, Akiva Nof versus the Ministry of Defense of the State of Israel, affirmed that one's right to grow a beard forms a part of one's human dignity, regardless of whether that beard is grown for religious reasons. The Akiva Nof case is interesting because it involved Israel's civil defense authority distributing special gas masks to men who wore beards, provided they sign a document attesting that they grew the beard for religious reasons. The case then introduces the issue of whether or not ordinary gas masks can get a good seal on the face of someone wearing a beard. While this is generally not a question that we deal with in the United States, uh, it is a question that Israelis faced during the first Gulf War and continued to face at the time uh, that uh, the case made it to the Israeli Supreme Court. And it's also a question that American soldiers likewise face as a matter of course. Can you get a good seal with your gas mask? And while the Establishment Clause might make American courts feel uncomfortable declaring precisely what it is that Jewish law has to say uh, about, uh, about growing beards, because this would seem to establish a particular version of Jewish law as normative, the justices of the Israeli Supreme Court seem to have no such qualms. Justice Eliyahu Maza wrote in the Nof case that Examination of Jewish law, however, reveals that religion does not require Jewish males to wear a beard. Indeed, the relevant religious obligation only prohibits shaving one's beard with a razor, and so on. So notice Justice Maza delving into Jewish law. Despite this, it seems to have been the claim of certain Hasidic groups in America that in fact Jewish law does require the wearing of a beard. Indeed, there is a responsum of the third Lubavitcher Rebbe to this effect. And these individuals have challenged the assertion that an ordinary gas mask cannot get a good seal on the face of a man wearing a beard. Of course, if it were the case that ordinary gas masks could indeed get a good seal on a bearded face, the Nof case would have been moot because the Israeli Civil Defense Authority would likely have preferred to have saved its money rather than provided special positive pressure gas masks, which apparently cost twice as much as ordinary gas masks for civilians wearing beards for any reason whatsoever. Whereas Admiral James Watkins' 1984 prohibition of beards in the US Navy seems to have been nothing more than one of a host of reforms cleaning up sailors' physical appearance, the ex post facto rationale common through the ranks of the American military seems to be that beards present a problem for hygiene, for good order and discipline as manifest in the uniform appearance of soldiers, and for getting a good seal on a gas mask. 
Of course, in the midst of nation building in Afghanistan, where wearing a beard could conceivably build cultural capital with locals who see facial hair as a sign of manhood, the military's own aims could actually be served by bending this particular rule. And in certain settings where gas attacks are unlikely, beards might not impinge on the military's goals. But the rationale of hygiene, good order and discipline, and the fit on a gas mask have emerged as the key pieces to the puzzle prohibiting beards. Interestingly, a Title X prohibition requiring that active duty soldiers and reservists be treated equally, right, aside, the Air Force actually has allowed chaplains who were granted a waiver by their commanding officers to wear a beard for religious reasons, right, provided that they serve on a tour of 30 days or less. So as a reservist myself, I'm in the Navy. If I was in the Air Force, I could just go for a weekend or for two weeks, retain a beard, right? And Army Colonel Jacob Goldstein has served as a chaplain in the Reserves and National Guard for more than 30 years um, wearing a beard by means of a waiver. I wish I could show you a photo of this guy. He's got a lovely white beard. Rabbi Goldstein has, has publicly asserted that the gas mask argument is specious and that he can not only put on his gas mask in eight seconds, but he can also get a sufficiently effective seal despite his extremely prominent beard. Yet Rabbi Goldstein's route into the chaplain corps was somewhat circuitous. He served in the New York Air National Guard and only came into the U.S. Army Reserve after he had reached the National Guard's mandatory retirement age. Goldstein's situation was atypical then, and he was only given a waiver when he came into the Army because of the Army's dire need for Jewish chaplains. Likewise, Goldstein's nephew, Rabbi Chesky Tannenbaum, eventually became a chaplain and has now risen to the make of rank of major. But he didn't do it through the Army or the Air Force or even the National Guard, as had his uncle. Rather, Chaplain Tenenbaum was commissioned into an organization called the Maryland Defense Force, a state militia that operates separately from the National Guard and which operates under a different set of regulations. Maryland is one of 22 states, plus Puerto Rico, which has such an organization. Although U.S. Army and Navy regulations are crystal clear that commanding officers are not permitted to grant waivers to the prohibition on beards, although soldiers, generally African-American, suffering from uh, pseudofolliculitis barbi may be granted a waiver on medical grounds, state militias do not necessarily have such regulations. Further, Maryland Defense Force chaplains are often sent on temporary assigned duty to the Maryland National Guard. And so Major Tenenbaum was able to sidestep the grooming standards which prohibit beards through a series of waivers and temporary assigned duty. In this way, Rabbis Goldstein and Tenenbaum have been able to chip away at regulations which, it seems, could have had a particularly legitimate role in serving the mission of the United States military. Of course, Rabbi Goldstein has publicly and explicitly rejected the claim that there is any combat-related purpose of, un uh, of uniformity uh, and, and uniformity of appearance could be behind the, uh, the regulations. Nonetheless, it's interesting to note that his strategy has avoided a frontal assault on a deeply entrenched set of regulations on personal grooming in the military, which have had mixed treatment in the courts. Right? He found his way in through the National Guard, same too with his nephew. However, in the wake of the 2000 Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, RLUIPA, a 2014 Department of Defense instruction prohibits denial of a request for religious accommodation where that denial would substantially burden a service member's exercise of religion, except where that denial serves to further a compelling government interest. Remember, when Michael presented strict scrutiny, these are some of the same terms that we've talked about. And he also spoke about how the pendulum shifted in employment versus Smith away from that strict scrutiny, but then he did mention, you know, artfully, that the, uh, that the Congress has been adopting measures, right, through politics, not through the courts, that have reinstated some of those uh, permissions. So uh, this very language is reminiscent of the RLUIPA, which one might otherwise think appropriate for how we conceive of persons in the military, whom we think of as institutionalized persons in the control and under the direction of the state. Right? if not quite in the same way that we think of prisoners who are also in an analogous situation. 
Indeed, as I mentioned before when discussing Neil Dilhoff's article, the case law on the issue of grooming has been much clearer for soldiers and prisoners than it has been for other classes of people. And while we might think that both of these classes of individuals may be forced to relinquish some of their civil liber liberties for the state ends, right? You're in the military, you're in prison, you might give up some of those civil liberties. The RLUIPA and the DOD instruction from 2014 both enshrine enhanced protection for religious exercise, including some involving grooming. At the same time, the DOD instruction is explicit that the DOD has a compelling government interest in mission accomplishment, including the elements of mission accomplishment, uh, which, uh, which are such as military readiness, unit cohesion, and good order, discipline, health, and safety on both the individual and unit levels. An essential part of unit cohesion is establishing and maintaining uniform military grooming and appearance standards. The 2014 DOD instruction followed on exemptions to the uh, grooming, rather exceptions to the grooming regulations that were, unlike the cases of Rabbis Goldstein and Tenenbaum, directly out of the active duty army. However, like that of the rabbis, the Sikh doctor, Tajip Singh Ratan, and the Sikh dentist, Kamaljit Singh Khalsi, who were given waivers to retain their beers back in 2010, were highly trained professionals in great demand by the military. One important change implemented by the DOD instruction is that requests for waivers that were handled in the past by commanding officers who could decide not to grant them on the basis of their own understanding of military necessity are now handled by the chief of staff for personnel of the various services. So this may serve to remove some of the unpredictability of leaving this power in the hands of commanders, right? A commander might decide arbitrarily, I'm going to give you this permission, I'm not going to give you that permission. It may also serve to broaden permissions that were only granted by commanders out of necessity and not out of a willingness to facilitate free exercise per se, as in the case of the Jewish chaplain serving a chaplain corps that's more than 95% Protestant, or Sikh doctors or dentists serving in similar high demand fields. To this end, a Reuters story on the DOD instruction showcased a Sikh serving as a corporal in the active duty army who'd been granted the waiver, suggesting that the Sikh doctor and dentist, right, the folks with all the training who might be in high demand, right, had successfully blazed a trail that's begun to be followed by a larger group, a rank and file of Sikhs. It's hard to say that these individuals were specifically responsible for the revisions to the earlier DOD instructions and opened the door to beards as a religious observance or whether this was simply the adoption by the military of their own form of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Either way, it would seem that the tactical problem with beards, specifically the inability to obtain a good seal on a gas mask, has been demonstrated to be nothing more than a kind of a red herring and the legal and social environment at large seems increasingly over the last three decades to favor the religious needs of individuals, even in an organization where individuality is typically sacrificed to group identity and objectives. As I explained in opening my paper, what I find particularly interesting about the case of beards in the military is the question of constitutionally protected free exercise impinging on the needs of the military. As recent legislation and administrative regulations, such as the DOD instruction, have tilted the scales in favor of increasingly public roles for individual religious preferences. The second issue I'd like to talk about today is the interaction between religious and civil divorce. As we'll see, the way the legislation has played out in at least one locality, New York State, may strike us as doing the same enshrining the individual religious preferences even where doing so might seem to impinge on the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. To begin, a bit of background concerning religious, Jewish religious divorce. Deuteronomy 24.1 reads as follows. A man takes a wife and possesses her. She fails to please him because of something obnoxious about her that he finds and he writes her a bill of divorcement, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. Because rabbinic readers of the biblical text see the text as assigning to the husband alone the power to initiate and effect divorce, traditional Jewish law requires that the Jewish divorce decree, the get in Hebrew, be written at his explicit consent alone. Thus, a woman wishing to be divorced but unable to obtain that consent 
may be termed a chained woman in Hebrew, an aguna. And while a controversial case this summer in Sfat, Israel involved a rabbinical court grant ordering a get to be written on behalf of a man in a permanent vegetative state without his express consent or request, on which our esteemed colleague Professor Michael Broyd has written, Jewish law is generally unmoving in requiring the consent of the husband. That's what you need to affect the get. Where that consent is being withheld by a man, right, whether out of spite in preventing his wife from moving on to remarriage, or whether in the hopes of extracting some assets from her in return for his consent, Jewish wives and Jewish legal authorities alike have few alternatives. According to Talmudic sources, the Jewish court holds the power to nullify marriage in certain cases, and in fact, in the late 20th century, at least one rabbinic court in New York, headed by the prominent rabbi Emanuel Rachman, was doing just that. But Rachman's efforts were actively opposed by much of the Orthodox Jewish community, as Rachman was seen as treading outside the specific boundaries for this procedure of nullifying marriage outlined by the Talmud. Another alternative to obtaining the husband's consent employed by Jewish women in the medieval period, right, what I do in my own uh, scholarly research, was simply to use Islamic courts to effect the divorce. The legal opinions of the medieval Geonim, the heads of the Talmudic academies of Iraq, suggest that these women would often convert to Islam in these situations, since Islamic law permits divorce to be initiated by either the wife or the husband. Such a divorce wouldn't be recognized by Jewish legal authorities, and it could mean the woman's marginalization or even excommunication from the Jewish community, but it would create conditions in which she could remarry in an Islamic court. Yet the primary solutions to the aguna problem generally involve obtaining the man's consent to the divorce, even if this might mean beating the man until he gave it. Indeed, the New York Times carried a story just last October about one ultra-Orthodox rabbi by the name of Mendel Epstein, who charged women as much as $60,000 to hire thugs to convince their husbands that they really did want to consent to writing the get for their wives. Two months ago, one of Rabbi Epstein's, uh, ra rather, one of Rabbi Epstein's uh, um, cohort pleaded guilty to conspiring to kidnap a husband to convince him to grant his wife a get. At the same time, though, the Talmud holds that the consent for writing the get may be nullified in certain circumstances if it's obtained only through coercion, depending on who uh, effects that coercion and what, under what conditions they affect it. So cognizant of the problems, the difficulty uh, obtaining a religious divorce presented for its denizens, who had nonetheless obtained a civil divorce, specifically that individuals, particularly women, for whom the state had removed all barriers to civil remarriage, were nonetheless unable to remarry because their ex-husbands had not removed the corresponding barriers to religious remarriage. Right? In the, in the early 1980s, New York State Legislature adopted Domestic Relations Law 253, known colloquially as the New York State Get Law which required marital partners to remove all barriers to future remarriage and ordered that courts take no action on the divorce until this had taken place. In the words of Alan Dershowitz, one of the individuals involved in drafting this law, everyone was trying to figure out a way of coercing without coercing and also a way of getting the state involved without getting the state involved. From the beginning, the bill's constitutionality was in question, an early version of the bill that sailed through both houses of the New York State Legislature was withdrawn prior to its ratification by Governor Kerry and only resubmitted with modifications in 1983 after Mario Cuomo had become governor. However, the influence of Jewish legislators and the New York Orthodox Jewish community alike encouraged the passing of the modified bill into law. Now, one tricky aspect of the law is that it seeks to avoid false attestations by the parties. To this end, rather than relying on the testimony of the ex-husband and the ex-wife themselves, and rather than having the state itself decide what Jewish law, or for that matter, what Islamic law or Catholic canon law might have to say about divorce, Domestic Relations Law 253 relied on an affidavit by the clergy person who performed the wedding to the effect that any barriers for the plaintiff to remarry in the future have or have not been removed. The advantages of this provision should be obvious. In particular, that the law avoids involving the state in determining the content of religious law. 
In this, we may see shades of the beards in the military issue, whereas Justice Eliyahu Maza was perfectly willing to outline his understanding of the beards in the military issue, right? In the uh, no versus uh, Ministry of Defense case, American courts have stayed out of determining whether or not Jewish law really does enjoy beards on its adherents. And likewise, New York State had really no desire to determine what religious law might have, have to say about how to dissolve a marriage. As the statute was written, its only concern was whether such barriers to future marriage had been removed. At the same time, the law's choice of a single religious figure, in this case the clergyman who had performed the marriage initially to be dissolved, certainly smacked of establishment problems. For instance, what if a couple married in the Roman Catholic Church and they subsequently converted to Judaism? Wouldn't the state's determination that a Catholic priest's determination that a Jewish couple was free to remarry or not seem like establishment of one or another religion as normative? In fact, this wasn't the only problem with the law. Legal scholars have suggested that there are problems with the law that concern due process, equal protection, and both the free exercise and establishment clauses. Although, of course, there's no universal agreement on any of these. Despite the problems imagined or real, the law continues to be enforced by the courts. The history of the New York State Get Law continued beyond the controversies at its inception. Realizing that a recalcitrant spouse could escape the law entirely by simply not counterclaiming and then not becoming a plaintiff subject to the law, the New York State Legislature adopted another stat uh, statute in 1992, this one called Section 236B of the Domestic Relations Law, authorizing the court to take either party's uh, inability to remarry into account in the context of equitable distribution of assets. Once again, scholars identified problems with the new law from both the free exercise and establishment perspectives, and one scholar even argued that the perceived duress that the new law uh, places on the divorcing couple by threatening to seize the assets of one of the parties from the other, right, in the event that the get is not granted, could even a priori nullify all guillotine written in the state. Early analysis of establishment problems within the get law would have fallen under the Lemon Test, the three-prong test emerging from a 1971 case, Lemon versus Kurtzman, whose middle prong eschewed any primary effect of advancing or inhibiting religion, and for, for which one might argue that Section 236B would have been unconstitutional, since the law effectively forces a husband seeking civil divorce to deliver a religious document to his wife. Yet with the recent declining popularity of the Lemon Test among Supreme Court justices, even though they continue to apply it as recently as 2000, these problems might not necessarily be damning. Despite the host of problems uh, of scholars of American and Jewish law alike, see with Section 236B, the 1992 version of the New York State Get Law, the law hasn't been repealed by the legislature nor invalidated by the courts. And while many scholars argue that it's simply bad law the social consequences of the law seem significant enough, particularly in a state where the number of women chained because of the Aguna problem runs in the thousands to encourage its continued existence. The law allows these women to use the American legal system to deal with what might otherwise be perceived as an inequality in Jewish law. The secular purpose of the law then may well be to accommodate the free exercise of these women as it facilitates their freedom to remarry, a right established by the Supreme Court. It's here that we can tie together the two sketches that I brought in this paper, Beards in the Military and the New York State Get Laws. In both of these cases, the American context has afforded a place of increasing prominence to religion in the public square. The legal developments in the New York State Get Law reflect an intensifying desire on the part of a Jewish population seeking a solution to the asymmetry in Jewish divorce by marrying it to the institution of secular divorce. As Paul Finkelman has pointed out in the Cardozo Women's Law Journal, this is an odd desire for any religious person. Historically, few religions, especially religious minorities, have fared well once they've asked the state to interfere with their internal structure. Finkelman's recommendation is that Jews and Jewish authorities avoid this entanglement. Yet at the same time, 
The greater deference granted free exercise in the wake of the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which itself was a precursor to the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act I mentioned above, may also point to a diminished concern with the establishment problems, which might be found in uh, Section 236B, particularly if the understood purpose of Section 236B is to accommodate the free exercise of marriage of women who would otherwise be chained to their husbands. We find that that same increasing deference to free exercise on the unshorn faces of soldiers who may now follow their conscience by wearing beards. In the case of beards then, military uniformity, good order and discipline has given some ground. In the case of the get laws, it's the concern that we avoid establishing one or another religious legal system. But at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries, we've seen free exercise manifest in these two issues surge ahead in the public sphere. <laughs>